in two minutes, our, our next reader will be Maggie Nelson. I should I should say in the six or seven places we uh, we uh, uh, advertise this, one of the places we accidentally put the typo, Maggie Smith, and Evan Kenley, over the uh, over the wit, wrote in and said. Uh, all those Downton Abbey uh, fans are going to be grossly disappointed. But I don't think they're going to be more disappointed than the third season. <laughs> and nobody can be disappointed with, uh, with Maggie Nelson, the author of um, Jane the Murder and Bluettes. So with 30 seconds to go, <laughs> everybody welcome <laughs> Maggie Nelson. I feel woefully like I don't know the rules for what we're doing, but that's where well, there are no rules. All right, half an hour, shortish things. Um, okay, here we go. How are you guys doing? Okay, so I'm going to read. Um, I brought like my safety blanket of this book, so that's going to be here in case I don't feel like reading my own stuff anymore. And then um, I'm going to read uh, from this new thing that I've been writing that was an essay and now I guess it's a book and I'm just gonna I just pulled out I just printed the pages that looked like they had the shortest parts so this is like a dream reading because it has to like I'm always trying to make it coherent and I don't have to make it coherent so it's just gonna be totally incoherent and then um, maybe I'll read a little bit from Bluets too but uh, all right. Once you said to me in anger You've written about all parts of your life except this, except the queer part. Give me a break, I spit back. I haven't written about it yet. I've spent a lifetime devoted to Wittgenstein's idea that the inexpressible will be contained inexpressibly in the expressed. This idea gets less airtime than his more reverential, more morose, whereof we cannot speak, we must be silent. But I think of the two, it is the deeper and more important idea. Its paradox is quite literally why I write, or how I feel able to keep writing. It is idle to fault a net for having holes, my encyclopedia notes. In this way, you can have your empty church with the dirt floor swept clean of dirt, and you can have your spectacular stained glass gleaming by the cathedral rafters both, because nothing you say can fuck up the space for God. I've explained this in other places, but I'm trying to say something different now. We do not live as if there were no time, but there is no time. Or that's what they say. I have only three hours to write, and my last hour is now upon me. There is a baby downstairs who needs to eat every three hours, and as I write, my breasts are filling up with milk. My body is marking the time. By the time I go downstairs, my breasts will be hard with milk. My nipples misshapen by it. And he will be eager for it, because he too feels the time that is no time. Since having a baby, I find I don't want to read Melanie Klein, Sigmund Freud, or Lacan. None of the heavyweights. Klein's morbid infant sadism and bad breast. Freud's blockbuster Oedipal saga and freighted Fort Da. Lacan's heavy-handed imaginary symbolic. None seem irreverent enough to address the situation of being a baby. Do castration and the phallus tell us the deep truths of Western culture or just the truth of how things are but might not always be? That's a quote. It astonishes and shames me to think I once found such formulations not only acceptable but compelling. Some psychoanalytic concepts may have derived from watching actual babies, though Freud's encounters were admittedly a bit hit and run. But now that they have been encrusted with seriousness, they feel like a plaque slathered onto a fundamentally surprised and surprising, newly awake being. A baby who's never been a baby before. A baby who's never been anything. In the face of such slathering, I find myself drifting into an anti-interpretive mood a la Sontag. In place of an hermeneutics, we need an erotics of art. But even Sontag's call for an erotics feels too heavy. I don't want an eros or a hermeneutics of my baby. Neither is dirty or mirthful enough. Today I am not interested in the bad breast for a dot or the mirror stage. I am interested in mouth exploring. You are alive today reading this because someone once adequately policed your mouth exploring. 
In the face of this fact, Winnicott holds the relatively unsentimental position that we don't owe these people, often women, but not always anything. But he says, we do owe ourselves an intellectual recognition of the fact that at first we were psychologically absolutely dependent, and that absolutely means absolutely. Luckily we were met, he writes, by ordinary devotion. By ordinary devotion, Winnicott means ordinary devotion. He says, it is a trite remark when I say that by devoted, I simply mean devoted. Winnicott is a writer for whom words often seem good enough. Let's never stop talking, I said, after we met, and we haven't. To assert oneself aligned or suffused with the real at the expense of others is to attempt to bar them, to shrivel them. But any fixed conviction of identity or of realness always also has a finger in psychosis. Lacan wrote, the madman is not only a beggar who thinks he is a king, but also a king who thinks he is a king. Perhaps this is why Winnicott's notion of feeling real is so moving to me. One can aspire to feel real. One can help others feel real, and one can oneself feel real. No one has to be it. There's something truly strange about living at a historical moment at which the conservative anxiety and despair about queers bringing down civilization and its institutions, marriage most notably, is met by the anxiety and despair so many queers feel about their failure and capacity of queerness to bring down civilization and its institutions, and their frustration with the assimilationist, unthinkingly pro-capitalist bent of the mainstream GLBTQ movement, which has spent fine coin begging entrance into new, two notably unjust and uninteresting structures, marriage and the military. It's heartless, I know, but I laughed out loud in my car yesterday when I heard a lesbian mom crying on the radio, weeping about being ejected from her position as a den mother in the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts? I'm not the kind of faggot who wants to put a rainbow sticker on a machine gun, declares C.A. Conrad, <laughs> to which one must say, I think, amen. And yet, I can't rid myself of the feeling that queer theory is trying in vain to hold on to something that is inevitably slipping away, perhaps because it was built on a faulty or outmoded or simply reactionary premise. The premise was the conviction that whom you desire, whom you fuck, what gender amalgam you feel yourself to be, will inevitably act as a guarantor of some kind of political radicality. But the fact is, this is a quote, you can be victimized and in no way be radical. It happens very often among homosexuals as with every other oppressed minority, said Leo Bersami. Every word that I write could be read as some kind of defense or assertion of value of whatever it is that I am whatever viewpoint it is that I ostensibly have to offer, whatever I've lived. As Eileen Miles says, as soon as someone opens their mouth, you know so much about them. Right away, she says, you might know you want to keep them out. That's part of the horror of speaking, of writing. There's nowhere to hide. When you try to hide, the spectacle can grow grotesque. Think of Joan Didion's reaction to the observation that her writing, specifically the year of magical thinking, in which she recounts how, after her husband's fatal heart attack, his blood stayed on the living room floor until, quote, Jose came in the next morning and cleaned it up, end quote, bears any traces of privilege. She said, privilege is a judgment, privilege is an opinion, privilege is an accusation, and privilege is an area to which, when I consider what came later, I will not easily cop. I am interested in offering up my experience and performing my particular manner of thinking for whatever they are worth, but never before have I ever been less interested in arguing for the rightness or the righteousness of any particular position or orientation. Sister Luce, what other reason is there for writing than to be a traitor to one's own reign, traitor to one's own sex, traitor to one's own class, traitor to one's majority, and to be a traitor to writing? Alice Notley called money zinnias. Gertrude Stein called orgasms, or bowel movements, depending on which scholar you believe, cows. Our kids call Harry Poppy and know him to be an in-betweener. I will admit, however, that in vulnerable moments, your ex's comments about playing house stung, 
And they sung even though I knew that the moment of queer pride is a refusal, this is a quote, to be ashamed by witnessing the other as ashamed of you. I knew that then just as I know it now, but sometimes one has to know something many times over. Sometimes one forgets what one knows and then remembers, and then forgets and then remembers, and then forgets again. As with knowledge, so too with presence. If the baby could speak to its mother, says Winnicott, here is what it might say. I find you. You survive what I do to you as I come to recognize you as not me. I use you. I forget you. But you remember me. I keep forgetting you. I lose you. I am sad. In his tome, Bubbles, the first of the trilogy's spheres, which opens out to include globes and foam. German philosopher Peter Slutter, I don't know how to say his name, anyone know? Slutter, did you? Elaborates something he calls the basic rule of negative gy gynecology. Through the basic rule of a negative gynecology, he writes, one must reject the temptation to extricate oneself from the affair with outside views of the mother-child relationship, where the concern is insight into intimate connections outside observation is already the fundamental mistake. I cheer this appear to appeal to immersive experience, this resistance to interpretation, this a priori rejection of external mastery. At the same time, I am annoyed with myself for consulting a seven, another 700-page treatise by a male heavyweight to tell me something revelatory about the bubble of mother-child in which I am currently ensconced. The late 20th century bookend to Heidegger's Being in Time, The Jacket of Bubbles, brags about itself. When I was growing up, my mother would sometimes tell me to switch the TV channel to a station with a whale, male weatherman. They usually have the more accurate forecast, she would say. Sometimes mothers, this is a quote, sometimes mothers, this is Winnicott, sometimes mothers find it alarming to think that what they are doing is so important, and in that case it is better not to tell them. It makes them self-conscious, and then they do everything less well. When a mother has a capacity simply to be a mother, we must never interfere. She will not be able to fight for her rights because she will not understand. As if mothers thought they were performing their ordinary devotions in the wild, then are stunned to look up and see a peanut-crunching crowd across the moat. The weather people are reading a script, I would say to my mother. It's all the same forecast. It's just a feeling, she would shrug. Alas, this isn't just a feeling. Even when women speak the same language as the philosophers, even when they're reading the same script or derive from the same satellites, their voices remain suspect. The performance is never seamless. The jig is already up. This is a quote in Irigaray. I'm trying this new thing where like, I put the people who say the thing in the margin, but then I don't have any way of telling you what's happening. Okay. Um, the performance is never seamless. The jig is already up. In other words, the articulation of the reality of my sex is impossible in discourse for a structural, eidetic reason. My sex is removed, at least as the property of a subject, from the predicative mechanism that assures discursive coherence. Erica Rye's answer to this conundrum, she says one must destroy, but with nuptial tools. The option left to her, she says, was, quote, to have a fling with the philosophers. Bubbles aims to be a bookend to being in time, not party to a fling. This despite its ridiculous name, which it shares with Michael Jackson's pet chimpanzee, <laughs> Bubbles. Michael Jackson doted on Bubbles, but he would also rotate the chimp out of service as it aged and replace it with a new, younger monkey, who he would also name Bubbles. <laughs> okay. A writer is someone who plays with the body of his mother, Roland Barthes. Sometimes the writer is also the mother, Mobius Strip. I think about this every morning from 4 to 6 a.m. as Iggy pulls my hair, mashes his face into my face, and plays a loose type of, loose type of patty cake with my palms, lassos his arms around my neck as I try to convince him in vain to sleep just a few minutes longer. Earlier told a long story about Jane Gallup and Rosalind Krauss, so this is picking that that. About a year after the Jane Gallup and Rosalind Krauss face-off, I hear through the grapevine that Rosalind Krauss suffered a devastating, nearly fatal brain aneurysm. 
It would be the height of coldness and irrationality to say that the caustic intelligence I saw on the dis on display that day she took down Gallup had caused Krauss to blow a gasket. But that was my first thought when I heard. In his book, Queer Optimism, Michael Snedeker salutes Winnicott's deflationary impulse, exemplified for Snedeker by Winnicott's, quote, non-ironic denomination of adolescent depression as doldrums. Now, deflation is easy to come by. We're all experts on not taking each other's pain seriously by virtue of the simple fact that it's not ours. Why doesn't she just get over it already? What's uncommon about Winnicott's impulse to deflate is that it arrives unattended by the impulse to dismiss. Winnicott takes the doldrums seriously. It's easy enough to wax lyrical about melancholy, says Snedeker. Less easy to wax lyrical about doldrums. I'm not against waxing lyrically, nor do I think is Snedeker, nor I don't think is Snedeker. His point is that lyrical waxing can signal an infatuation with overarching concepts or figures, which can run roughshod of the specificities of the situation at hand. Winnicott accused Freud, for example, of using the concept of the death drive to, quote, achieve a theoretical simplification that might be compared to the gradual elimination of detail and the technique of a sculptor like Michelangelo. This danger would come as no surprise to many writers, especially to those who have attempted to pay homage in their writing to a beloved. Wayne Kustenbaum once told me this instructive story on this account. Some psycho girlfriend of mine decades ago answered a long rhapsodic, rhapsodic, rhapsodic letter I'd written to her with this terse, humiliating rebuff. Next time, write to me. That one command on a tiny slip of paper tucked into an envelope. I remember thinking, wasn't I writing to her? How could I know when writing to her that I secretly wasn't writing to her? At that point, Derrida hadn't yet, this is still Wayne, hadn't yet written the postcard, so I didn't know what to do with my befuddled, wounded sense of being a rhapsodic narcissist of a letter writer, weirdly instructed to relate, to speak to someone instead of to the nothingness at the end of writing. The nothingness at the end of writing. This explains, at least in part, my discomfort with texts addressed to or dedicated to babies, un unborn or infant. Such gestures are undoubtedly born from love, I know, but the illiteracy of the addressee, not to mention the temporal gap between the moment of the address and that at which the child will have grown into enough of an adult to receive it, presuming one ever becomes an adult in relation to one's parents, underscores the discomforting relation, fact that relation can never be achieved through writing in a simple fashion if it can be achieved at all. It frightens me to involve a tiny human being in this misfiring, in this nothingness from the start. Words may be good enough, but the older I get, the more I feel wax fear waxing lyrical about those I love the most. Cordelia. I remember in the, my first feminist theory class reading Erica Rye's famous essay, When These Lips Speak Together, in which Erica Rye critiques both unitary and binary ways of thinking by focusing on the morphology of the labial lips. They are the sex which is not one. There are two lips rather than one penis, and they are indivisible. They are not one, but also they are not two. They make a circle which is always self-touching, an autoerotic mandorla. This image immediately struck me as weird, but exciting, and a little embarrassing. It reminded me of the fact that a lot of women can jerk off just by pressing their legs together on a bus or in a chair or whatever. Once I came this way while waiting to see the tears of Petra von Kant at the film forum in the outside line. While we were discussing Erica Ryan class, I tried to feel my labial lips touching each other in an autoerotic circle. I imagined every woman in the class trying to feel it too. But the thing is, you can't really feel your labial lips. Every sentence I write, I imagine Annie's eyes upon washing it clean. Even though Annie has stood firmly against just about every bit of content I have ever committed to the page. But Annie, too, knows that content is often quite small. The self without sympathetic attachments is either a fiction or a lunatic, wrote Adam Phillips. He continues, yet dependence is scorned, even in intimate relationships, as though dependence were incompatible with self-reliance. 
rather than the only thing that makes it possible. I know all about this scorn for dependence. It laced my milk. As a result, I often act as though other people's needs are repulsive. At times, I have actually wondered whether my entire sense of self-worth is based on a conviction of my hypercompetence and a rational but fervent belief in near-total self-reliance. Once a professor said to me, you're a great student because you don't have any baggage. At that moment, the subterfuge of my life was complete. <laughs> Perhaps to get off the ride, I should start at home, as they say. I, too, would need to stop thinking that my mother could satisfy my desires if she really wanted to, even or especially if my most aching desire is for her to renounce patriarchy. Ann Carson said, historically, we use man for people of any gender because men win. So it's useful to do that when you're cornered. I consider myself a member of one of the first generations in which women win. I know the numbers don't back this up, but I consider it so anyway. I decree it. This is a quote. This is Eileen Miles. Last summer, I was standing alone on a hill with my dog and a car as an amazing shower of meteorites flash, flash, stained the sky orange. It was so sensational. I was utterly alone with my animal. I knew I was a man. It was utterly clear. There was no thing of woman at all. I was standing in nature alone, just this guy. It was a terrifically human feeling, alone, completely full. What would it feel like, this terrifically human feeling, alone, completely full, and completely female? Eileen knows the answer to this question, too. And that's why her work doesn't just sketch the problem, but lives its solution. I don't always feel woman, but I don't ever really feel man. I don't know if I'm missing something. At the 2012 Pride intervention in Oakland, some anti-assimilationist activists unfurled a banner that read, Capitalism is fucking the queer out of, like, U.S., so us and U.S. Capitalism is fucking the queer out of us. There was also a distributed pamphlet that read, What is destructive to straight society, we know we can never be commodified or purged of rebellion. So we maintain our stance as fags, queers, dykes, trans girls and boys, and gender queers, and all combinations of in-betweeners, and those that negate it all at the same time. We bide our time, striking here and there. We fantasize of a world where all of the exploited can come together and attack. We want to find you, comrade, if this, too, is what you want. For the total destruction of capital, bad bitches, we will fuck your shit up. This dream of attack, the interpolating comrade. I have come to understand revolutionary language as a sort of fetish, in which, in which case one feasible response of mine to the above might be, our perversities are not compatible. Perhaps it's the word radical that needs to be retired reconfigured, but what shall we angle ourselves toward instead? Openness? Is that good enough? Hema Chodron writes, you're the only one who knows when you're using things to protect yourself and keep your ego together, and when you're opening and letting things fall apart, letting the world come as it is. You're the only one who knows. And I say, and the thing is, you barely know. In Annie Sprinkle's performance, 100 Blowjobs, Sprinkle, who worked for many years as a prostitute, kneels down on the ground and gives head to several dildos nailed to a board in front of her, while recorded male voices yell degrading things like, suck it, bitch. Sprinkle has said that out of approximately 3,500 customers she had as a sex worker, there were 100 bad ones. The soundtrack to 100 blowjobs derives from these encounters. She sucks and sucks. She chokes and gags. But just when you might be thinking, this is exactly what I imagined sex work to be like, haunting, woman-hating, traumatizing, Sprinkle gets up, pulls herself together, gives herself an Aphrodite Award for sexual service to the community, and performs on stage a cleansing masturbatory ritual. Annie Sprinkle is a good witch. And the good witch says, just because I have enemies does not mean I have to be paranoid. A good witch says, there is nothing you can throw at me I cannot metabolize or die trying. Once I suggested I had written half a book drunk and half a book sober, Bluets. Here I suggest that I have written nine-tenths of these words written free and one-tenth hooked up to a hospital-grade breast pump. Words piled into one machine, milk siphoned out by another. Many women describe the feeling of having a baby come out of their vagina as taking the biggest shit of their lives. 
this isn't really a metaphor. Constipation is one of pregnancy's principal features. The growing baby literally deforms and squeezes the lower intestines, changing the shape, flow, and plausibility of one's feces. In late pregnancy, I was amazed to find my shit when it had, would finally emerge had been deformed into Christmas tree ornament-type balls. <laughs> then all through my labor, I could not shit at all, as it was keenly clear to me that letting go of the shit would mean the total disintegration of my perineum, anus, and vagina all at once. I also knew that if or when I could let go of the shit, the baby would probably come out too, but to do so would mean falling forever and going to pieces. In perusing the Q&A sections of pregnancy magazines at my OBGYN's office before labor, I learned that a surprising number of women have had a related but distinct concern about shit in labor. Either that or the magazine editors are making it up as projective propaganda. Question. If my husband watches me labor, how will he ever find me sexy again, now that he's seen my vagina accommodate a baby's head and shit involuntarily come out my asshole? This question confused me. Its description of labor did not strike me as exceedingly distinct from what happens during sex, or at least some sex, or at least much of the sex I had heretofore taken to be good. No one asked, how does one submit to falling forever, to going to pieces? That is a question from the inside. Once I said to you, when anger disguised as compassion, or compassion disguised as anger, I just want you to feel free. Don't you get it yet? You yelled back. I will never feel as free as you do. I will never feel as at home in my own skin. That's just the way it is and always will be. Well, then I feel really sorry for you, I said. Or maybe I said, fine, but don't take me down with you. Whatever I said, it lacked tenderness. I hope you can forgive me. It is hard to say exactly what we are doing when we shame someone for something. Often we're trying to change them by attempting to infuse them with a bad feeling about a part of them we would like to see abolished. But even if we are successful in producing the bad feeling, it doesn't abolish the unwanted part. Instead, the bad feeling sticks to it and begins a process of accretion, shame snowball. What I meant to say was, one of your legs ap appears to be flailing and free, but now I see the other is caught and grievously wounded. Is there another way out of this track besides gnawing? And now, after living beside you all these years and watching your wheel of a mind bring forth an art of pure wildness, as I labor grimly on these sentences, wondering all the while if prose is but the gravestone marking the forsaking of wildness, I am no longer sure which of us is more at home in the world, which of us is more free. Afraid of assertion, always trying to get out of totalizing language, realizing this is another form of paranoia. Bart found the exit to this merry-go-round by reminding himself that it is language which is assertive, not he. It is absurd, he said, to try and flee from language's assertive nature by adding to some sentence, each sentence, some little phrase of uncertainty, as if anything that came out of language could make language tremble. My writing is riddled with such ticks of uncertainty. It tolerates no decision, this is a quote from Zizek from earlier, it tolerates no decision, no instance of the two, no evaluation in the strong Nietzschean sense of the term. I have no excuse or solution save to allow myself my tremblings than to go back in later and try to slash them all out. Well, almost all. Trying to find a good one to end with here. The combo pack of academic training and socialization as a white female teaches that rather than express outrage, one is supposed to, above all else, find things interesting. As in, I'm interested in anger. I clamber along to find its source in person. For something to be interesting, you have to have climbed far enough out of the bubble to be able to regard it. This is Buddhist in its way, getting to the point at which you can watch your thoughts and feelings float by without getting ensnared by them, without being convinced of their reality. But it also disobeys the rule of negative gynecology, which in case you forgot is where the concern is insight into intimate connections. Outside observation is already the fundamental mistake. The question becomes how to regard the inside from the inside. 
Many of my favorite writers, David Vonerovich, Eileen Miles, James Baldwin, are not interested in anger. They are possessed by it. Thank you for your anger, host Anna Joy Springer once said to Wanda Coleman after a bristling performance by Coleman, which ended with her storming out of the theater. I quivered in my seat, white girl style, waiting for Coleman to come back and pronounce the end of the performance, the end of the anger. She did not come. I think we'll end there, so thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you. Didn't even need my kitchen. <laughs>